Uh, folks, a little introduction to uh, this video and to all the research I've done. I need to... Uh, uh, I, I have had some assistance in preparing all this information uh, and I want to give credit to, uh, to he who has given me the assistance. Uh, now, it's not going to be what most people think, uh, but it's important at this point for me to acknowledge where I believe this information has come from. Some of you may... Uh, not be pleased with what I say, some of you may, it's not really the point is it? Uh, credit where I believe credit is due. So I am a born again Christian and I believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and the Saviour and I do believe I have the Holy Spirit and about, oh, I don't know how long ago now, about six years ago I offered up a prayer from the depth of my heart I wanted God to reveal to me the whole truth of what is going on, no matter how ugly it might be. And I believe he has done that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not some magical thing. Uh, it's, it doesn't feel like magic. I don't have a special feeling. Uh, I just find that, uh, you know, I'll, uh, as I... As I um, uh, the video on the, t the title of Mystery and what it means. I searched for that for years. And then, well, when it, whenever I uploaded it, probably around eight months ago, I think, thereabouts, uh, the night before I uploaded it, uh, I just woke up at about three in the morning and I was thinking about what does this title Mister mean? I don't know why I was thinking about it. It was not a subject that had been in my mind for months. It, it, I'd looked at it probably a year before and just found I couldn't get anywhere, I couldn't find anything on it. And uh, I just woke up, and then as I'm sitting there at three in the morning in bed, like within a few minutes of waking up and, and thinking, what is this title, mister? Um, the thought came to me, why don't you write the word out in full and break it into its syllables and look at what the prefix miss and the suffix term mean? So I did it. I didn't know, I went to the computer and I had a look, and lo and behold... When I'd done the research and put it all together, I found out that it fit exactly with the rest of the research. Uh, so I ascribe that to the Holy Ghost, pointing me in a direction and revealing knowledge. It's been a long, slow process. It's been seven years. So you make of that what you will. You believe what you will. I believe what I believe. So I just want to um, say... That, uh, and give credit to the Most High God for this information, for where he's led me. Uh, I haven't done it before because I never felt I was there. I wanted to have something that I'm now extremely confident that I know what's going on. As you'll see as you watch this video, I've got what I believe is very strong evidence that I've got pretty much everything in order. I'm not saying there's not a few little pieces to put in place still, but I, I believe I have enough that... Uh, I know how to defeat anything in a court of law that I wish to defeat. So with that, I hope you'll uh, enjoy the information in the video and uh, we'll now get to it. G'day folks. Um, this is going to be a different style of video for this channel. I haven't done one for quite a long time. Uh, I've had a few other things on the go. Uh, and this is going to be a rambling conversation. Um, it's not going to be as concise as other videos I've done. I'm not going to post a lot of information. I'm just going to relate to you some experiences I've had and some things that I've discerned and retouch on um, what's happening, what is the, our situation in the law. So if this is the first time you're watching this video, it's probably not going to make a lot of sense to you. All the evidence... Uh, on which I rely is posted in other videos. When I do say evidence, I know the difference between evidence and an opinion, and I distinguish the two quite clearly in the videos, and there's really only one or two opinions. Everything else is evidence with fact. And when I say fact, I mean, if I say your proper name is your Christian name only, I have two law dictionary definitions that say the same, and I have two English dictionaries that say the same. So it's not something that I just clutch out of thin air and say, that's what seems right to me. Uh, so what I want to explain to you is uh, ultimately how to uh, win a court case. It, it, depending on what we define win as, okay? 
So, but we'll come to that. So it's going to be a bit of a, um, as I said, a bit of a ramble. Uh, so I hope you'll forgive me for that. But uh, it takes a lot of work for me to do it concisely, a lot of editing, and I'm not going to edit this one. It's just going to um, run straight. So that's how it's going to be. So I'll get into it now without uh, too much more fluff. Uh, so I want to explain to you, I've, I've had a couple of court cases this year. I want to discuss those and what I take from those. Uh, and I want to start with issues like the birth certificate and those sort of things and flesh out what's really going on, it, uh, what I see going on. So I want to start with the fact that a legal name is the name of an estate. But in particular, if I want to be more definitive, the surname is the name of an estate, an estate that has been established for you. Now, where I'm going to go with this is I'm going to suggest that there are, at a minimum, three estates. Some people might say, oh, that's Unum Sanctum says there's three trusts. I looked at Unum Sanctum and I didn't see that there's three trusts there. Uh, but to me, that's immaterial. It doesn't really matter what, whether Unum Sanctum is establishing a trust or not establishing a trust. I'm going to explain to you the trusts that are established and how Unum Sanctum and the Vatican might key into that, but it really isn't that important whether they do or whether they don't. So I'm going to start with the, your first estate. And um, I note this. In the Bible, it talks of angels who had left their first estate. So I'm going to explain to you what I perceive your first estate to be. And then I'm going to explain to you how uh, you've moved from your first to your second and then your third estate. And you are currently, if you're like most people, in operating in your third estate. So the first estate is this. On, on a joyous day, hopefully, uh, you were born, you came into this world. Now, when you came into this world, you came into the world as a sovereign being. Uh, but it was evident that you were a sovereign being that required uh, a fiduciary, a trustee, someone to take care of you. Now, I say the first estate requires no paperwork, no, no particular knowledge, just an observation of common sense. And that is that when you're born, whilst you're sovereign, you can't express your will, you can cry, but no one knows whether that's because you're hungry, tired, want your nappy changed, want a cuddle, or have a tummy ache. So you're not able to express your will, and you need someone to interpret your will and to fulfil your will for you, to act on your behalf. And I would say that... Uh, I, would, I use the term God, others might want to use the term nature... You can ascribe that to whatever power you wish, but the facts are evident. It's these, these, these are some things are self-evident. They don't require uh, any proof other than what is self-evident to us all. That your mother, particularly, and your father, are your fiduciaries. So you come into this world, and they are going to take care of you. And there is a trust. And the trust is that they will act in what they consider to be your best interests and make decisions for you until you're able to make decisions for yourself. So that is your first estate. Uh, I would say the grantor is God Almighty. Uh, you may prefer to say nature. That's up to you. Uh, but the trustee, the fiduciary of that estate, is your mother and your father. So your mother may decide that it's in your best interest to have demand feeding. She may decide in your best in, it's in your best interest to um, be fed on a on a time, well every four hours, and ignore demand feeding. And she may decide that it's best for you to have in this day and age to have um, an artificial substance for sustenance, uh, powdered milk, powdered baby milk formula, whatever. So the, the point is, she's going to make that decision for you and the presumption is she's making it in what she believes to be your best interests. Okay? Uh, 
if you have a mother that drinks a lot of alcohol and then breastfeeds you, well, that's going to affect you. And uh, as your fiduciary, that is her decision to make on your behalf. Uh, so that is your first estate. And the trustees or the, the fiduciaries, I'm using fiduciary as a fiduciary is someone who owes you a duty of care. And I'm saying that it's self-evident in nature that your mother and father owe you a duty of care, and that is your first estate. And your mother and father have full power to make all decisions on your behalf. There's no restraint on the decisions they make on your behalf. If they decide that it's best for you to be left outside in the cold, naked, because it'll toughen you up, Hopefully they do it for that reason and not because they want to get rid of you. But, you know, if, they, if your mother and father decide, oh, no, we, we, this kid needs to be tough, we'll put him outside naked and leave him out there in the cold for however long, well, that's what's going to happen to you. And that's their, they're empowered to make that decision, I would say by God. Uh, as I said, some might say by nature. So that is a self-evident first estate. However, what happens in the modern age is that you quickly find that your put into a second estate. Now, when I say you're put into a second estate, you are not put into your sec into the estate. Your body, your soul, your spirit are not in the second estate. Estates are... Um, what an estate is, is your property. Uh, real estate or pers your personal estate. So real, real estate being land, however you define that, and... Uh, personal estate being personal property. Amongst your personal pop property under the law are your rights. Okay? So you have... So rights, intangible rights, are part of your property. So the right the right to, to um, do what you need to do to live, to sustain your life, that is a right. Okay? It's not tangible, but if you're starving then you have the right to access food. Okay, If you're thirsty, you have the right to drink water. You have the right to breathe the air, etc., etc. There's a whole host of other intangible rights, and uh, I could get into those. Um, but you have a whole host of rights. That is what is in your estate. Not you, not your body, not your soul, not any of that sort of stuff. What's in the estate is your property. Now, what the government does in this day and age is... Um, without really ever giving full information and with, and certainly doing it by deceptive purposes, which I don't think many of us would uh, doubt they do often, uh, given the last few years, but, uh, and hopefully you'd picked up that a lot sooner, but the government comes along and makes an offer to your mother and father uh, and offers to uh, take on the responsibility of caring for you in a second estate. And because mum and dad don't understand what's going on, they fill out all the paperwork and effectively agree to nominate the government to be the fiduciaries of your second estate. Now, when mum and dad do this, the law permits them to issue any instructions that they wish to the government on how you how they are to manage your estate okay and any time the government so it's like subcontracting subcontracting it out mum and dad without knowing it have subcontracted out uh, your property to be managed by the government and the way and so the government then takes on that responsibility so now you have a second estate where your rights are held but at any time, mum and dad in the first estate can call back their, those rights and can issue directions on how those rights are to be managed. Because, I probably should have said this sooner, any estate is, has one purpose. And the purpose of every estate is to provide a benefit to the beneficiary. You, the newborn, are the beneficiary. Uh, mum and dad in the first estate, ex their, their uh, duty of care to you is to provide you with the maximum benefit. The trick is, what is a benefit is in the eye of the beholder. And I'll explain what that later on. 
but because you can literally claim anything's a benefit. And I'll give you an example. Uh, when my sons were at school and they were younger, uh, a lot of their classmates would, um, I would hear, well, you know, they were they were allowed to stay up till 10, 10 o'clock at night. This is like when they're eight, nine, something like that. Uh, my sons were going to bed at probably about seven, seven thirty, when they were eight and nine. So the parents, and I use the word parents as distinct from mum and dad, and I'll explain that in a second. Uh, the parents have decided that it's in the child's benefit. It's a benefit to the child to be able to stay up late, 10 o'clock, and do what they want. I, as a separate parent, have decided that it's a benefit to my sons to go to bed at 7 or 7.30. So I'm saying going to bed early is a benefit. Someone else is saying going to bed late is a benefit. So that's where you can have two opposing views, both of which claim to provide a benefit to the beneficiary. And that's what I mean by anything can be turned into a benefit. So uh, getting back to the second estate, the government is running now runs a second estate and uh, they must operate in accordance with any instructions mum and dad give. Alas, because mum and dad do not know any of what has taken place and are unaware that they have just given their child's rights to the government to manage, like on a subcontract basis, they don't ever issue any instructions. So in a situation where there's a dearth of instructions, a trustee has to act according to what they believe is in the best interests of the beneficiary. So that's what the government does. So, but what the government does when you're born having established a second estate, is that they immedi immediately establish a third estate. And the third estate has your parents as your fiduciaries. And it has you again as the beneficiary, and your rights are then put into the third estate. So the government... So what's happened is mum uh, and dad have subcontracted the management of the estate to the government, creating a, the second estate, and then the government has subcontract, subcontracted that right, uh, that duty, back to mum and dad, who I now call parents, in the third estate. And so now mum and dad have the care of the child, but they have it under the government, OK? And then the government... So, sorry, I should say parents. I'm using parents. So your parents have the uh, duty to administer your estate in the third estate, which is, a, is like a subcontract arrangement with the government. But they're subject to the government's instructions on how they're going to perform that duty. The government then holds its um, obligations subject to the instructions from mum and dad in the first estate. The problem is mum and dad don't ever issue instructions, but the government certainly does. And the government's instructions on how your estate is to be managed is what we call statutory law. So all statutes and regulations and the like are instructions on how parents will administer their child's estate. And what this has done is it's taken mum and dad who are in charge and above all others and the, the net effect is to take them from mum and dad who run everything in the first estate and turn them into parents who are subject to government instruction in the third estate. And the government sits in the middle, keeping mum and dad ignorant of their power as mum and dad and telling the parents what they will do. Okay, So those are your three estates. And it's not you that's being shifted in the estates. It's your property your rights, but in effect you can be controlled through your property and rights, especially when you're the beneficiary and you don't know you're the beneficiary. So, I had a couple of beers I put in the freezer, I thought I'd do, drink a couple of beers while I have this, so I'm going to go get one when I think they're cold enough. Um, so that's your three estates. Now I know that lines up a little bit with three trusts in Unum Sanctum, and you could argue that uh, the Vatican established um, a trust, but it doesn't the only way it still requires mum and dad to put you into, to transfer their rights to that trust. The, 
the Vatican, I don't believe, has just grabbed hold of you and wrested you from your mother and father uh, violently. They have grabbed hold of you and wrested you from your mother and father by deception. But in the legal system, that's okay. Legally, there's nothing wrong with that. Just like Bill Clinton said, um, when I uh, said I, I didn't have sexual relations with that woman, whilst that was legally accurate, so that's legally accurate. And it is legally accurate. It's deceptive, but it's legally accurate. Uh, so the, the legal system exists basically to deceive people, I would say. Uh, it's a bunch of rules that are deliberately kept opaque, so you can't really grasp what's going on unless you really put a lot of time into it. So there are your three estates, okay? Now then what happens is you're a young, we'll go with a young man, boy, growing up, and uh, finally, so, and okay, just as an, uh, will I do that now? Okay. So all these uh, people, mum and dad, the government, and parents, are all administrators of estates for your benefit. Okay. Mum and dad's administration of your estate probably ceases when you reach the age of majority. Uh, but the government doesn't. And there's a reason for that, because you need to have an administrator at all times. Okay, so what's happening in, in, in real life? Well, in real life, as a, as, a, as a boy, for example, using myself as an example, um, when I was younger, I was referred to um, master, as master. My title was master. So you remember that joke, master baits? We all used to, you know, when, when we were kids at school, we'd all, there was a joke and there was, I can't remember the joke. All I remember is the punchline was master, because a young boy is called master, uh, and the guy's surname was Bates, so it was master Bates. And that was meant to be very funny. Don't worry, that's just my neighbour doing what needs to be done. Uh, so... Uh, that's Master Bates. And then, oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> that's the title Master. So I'm just rambling. See, normally I'd edit all those faux pas out, so I'm leaving them in this time because I don't have the energy to spend hours editing. Uh, and if you look at, like, just as another example, you look at uh, Batman, and Alfred refers to him as uh, Master Wayne because he is the master. Why do you have the title master when you're a boy? Well, because you're the beneficiary and you are the master of that estate. Just like uh, when the king is nine years old, a prince regent is put in to administer the kingdom in his name, in the king's name. He's not the king, but he makes all the decisions as though he is the king because the king doesn't yet have the capacity to do it himself. And that's you as a boy. So you are the master. And then, as you reach the age of majority, you become mister. Uh, so, what's happening when you become mister? Well, what, what happens? You're the beneficiary. Your only role in the estate as a boy is that you're the beneficiary. But then, as you get to the point where you start operating in society, you do something. You step out and you start operating in your legal name. You start doing things in your legal name. So uh, you might open a bank account, you might get a driver's license, you might enrol to vote, who knows? But you start doing things in that name. Okay, as I pointed out before, there's only three ways you can become an administrator of an estate. One is via a will, which is called uh, an, an executor testamentarius. The other is by applying to be the administrator, and that is done by letters of administration and is called executor dativus. And the third is to do it without getting a proper appointment, and that is called executor de son tort, which translates into English as executor of his own wrong and is an unlawful taking of the office of administrator of that estate. And it doesn't matter that it's your own estate. Okay? Uh, 
So you're now administering your own estate unlawfully. And I did a video on what the title Mr. means. Uh, and uh, oh, at this, I need to give credit to someone in a minute. And it's, not who, it's not going to be anyone most people imagine, but it's important that I do it. So I'm just going to explain. I woke up one night, having I've looked at the definitions of Mr. None of them seem to give anything away. And um, probably six or eight months ago, I woke up at about three in the morning and I was thinking about... I don't know why, I just missed her. I thought, what is that? And I hadn't been looking at it at all. I'd sort of set it aside because it was something I couldn't crack. And I just had the thought, why don't I split it into two? Uh, split it into its uh, syllables, miss and ter. And to cut a long story short, the prefix miss means wrong or improper. Misappropriate, mistake, misspeak, misdeed misconduct, it's all wrong, it all means wrong or improper. So miss means wrong or improper. Ter means relation. And the words that confirm that are matter, which means mother, patter, which means father, uh, frater, which means brother, and sister, which we still use as sister. Uh, the reason sister didn't become, didn't have a T-H-E-R put on it when it was put into English is because it'd be sister, and it makes you sound like you're lisping. So they left it as sister. But T-E-R on the end of a word denotes a relation. So Mr. is wrong or improper relation. To what? Well, it's Mr. Doe. And what's Doe? Doe is the name of your estate. So it's a wrong or improper relation to your estate, which is the unlawful relation of an executor to song tour. So you see, there are two pieces of the jigsaw puzzle that fit together. All right. So, uh, and up till now, I must admit, uh, the way I've tended to handle things is I haven't used the legal name for years. And it's been difficult. Because I was of the opinion that it's wrong or improper for me to do it, so I'm just not going to do it. That's, just, that's sort of how I am. Once I realised that, that, once I realised that wasn't proper, I said, right, I'm not going to use it. Uh, and so then that meant that I was... Well, eventually, I got to the point where I realised I was the beneficiary. So, that, well, I'm just the beneficiary. Okay, well, if you're using the legal name, then you're considered to be, by the law, to be both the administrator and the beneficiary at the same time. Okay, and this is where it gets quite tricky and intricate. And I'll, I'll, I'll get to that. I'm just thinking if my beer's cold enough, but we'll leave it a little longer. I'm getting a bit dry, though. Um... So, uh, where are we? Wrong or improper? So, that's Mr. But you don't have to have a, a magistrate. Magistrate is not a wrong or improper relation. They, For a magistrate to operate, um, and I'll explain this, if you go back and look at the video I did on, um, I think it's called Executor de Sontort, Executor de Sontort or de Jure or something like that. Um, anyway, in that I go through and I point out there's different categories of administrators of your estate. When I say executor, administrator, trustee, fiduciary, it's all the same thing. Okay, They're all effectively the same. Uh, some might be slightly technically different, but in the end, they're all, they're all people who um, hold an office where they owe a duty of care to a beneficiary. So, um, like a magistrate, in order to have authority over you, has to have his appointment to administer your estate lawfully. And he does. When he's, when he's the magistrate, he's administering your estate. Now, uh, but when I went through through explaining uh, the different categories of administrator, there's you can break them up into the three ways I already have: um, appointed by, by by a will, appointed by letters of administration, or not appointed. You just took hold of the office without an appointment. Okay, those are the, those are three categories. There's a separate way to classify it, and that is um, a general administrator who administers everything or a specific administrator who only administers specific things. So if you're in court for, for a speeding fine, the magistrate will be there and he will only be administering your estate in terms of dealing with the speeding fine. He has a limited appointment to deal with the speeding fine. And what you find is every government department is, administering your, is there to administer your estate. All government exists to administer your estate. Um... I'm having so many other thoughts banging here that I could throw in 
to sort of evidence that. And sometimes, so sometimes the train gets. I head down a little tangent, but just to, just to uh, you'll find the evidence is out there if you know what to look for. So, for example, um, Joe Biden is running the White House before him. Uh, Trump was, and before him, Obama, and blah blah. What is one term they use to refer to uh, Joe Biden's White House? They call it the Biden administration because the government exists to do nothing more than administer your estate. And their raison d'etre in everything they do is to provide benefit to your estate. So everything the government does is meant to provide your estate a benefit. Okay? Um, but if you think about it, they're all called administrations because they're administering your estate. They're not administering a debt, they're administering people's estates. Um, I know I had a couple others that would, t would basically point the same thing. And as you, as you go through, if you pay attention and you, and you get what the core of what's going on, you can confirm different things. This is what I do. I just, things get confirmed because, like I said, you hold your office, once you reach your age of majority and just start using your legal name, you hold your office unlawfully. And then I figure out what the, the title Mr. means, and that is an unlawful appointment. But they can, con they can control you even if you have a lawful appointment because all administrators must do, must, must administer at the third level. In the third estate, which is the one you're administering if you're using the legal name, you're, still oper you're operating in the third estate. The government's in the second estate issuing you continual instructions called statutes or laws on how you're to administer that estate. So if they issue a law that affects you, Chainsaw. If they issue a law that affects you, then that's an instruction to you on how you are to administer your own estate. Okay. Um, I'm hoping that chainsaw is not going to wreck this because I don't want to do this again. This is my third attempt. Uh, anyway, we'll see. Uh, actually, I might go and grab a beer. I think I'm getting a bit dry. Uh, so I'll be back in a sec. All right, where were we? Uh, so anyway, if you look around and you pay attention, you know what words to look for. Uh, see, as I said, the estate exists. The raison d'etre for them, for them existing, for government existing, is to administer your estate. It's all about administration of your of estates. Uh, another anecdote that I'll just pull um, out of the memory bank. When COVID came, I was looking into legal history on mandates for vaccines. And there's a case which some of you may be familiar with. I think it's around 1907. I think, like, this is a vague... I haven't got all the... Uh, there's, this is not a um, verbatim recollection of the facts. I think it was in New York, and I'm pretty sure it was um, a mandate for the smallpox vaccine, and if you didn't take it, they, there was a fine of $5. OK? And this guy went to court to argue it. And he presented all the medical information, all the rest of it, blah, blah, blah. Presented, you know, pretty solid arguments. In the end, the judge said, it's not important that the vaccine is safe or effective. All that matters is that the government believes that it is of benefit. Because their only obligation is to provide a benefit to your estate. And they determine what they consider to be a benefit. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Uh, ultimately, the ultimate arbiter of what is a benefit to your estate is the beneficiary. But, again, as the beneficiary, you remain silent. Now, for those who, and I'm just, I'm just, this, this is the thing, I'm scatting all over the place here, bouncing around. So have you ever heard people say, if you've been in this space for a while, you've heard people say, you have to waive the benefit. What benefit? I'm going to explain it to you now. So you have to waive the benefit to your estate. In that man's case, if he had said, well, I waive the benefit, he's waiving the perceived benefit of the smallpox vaccine. 
okay? He didn't do that, so he had to pay the fine. Okay, this is where it gets tricky, and this is what I, what I has crystallised for me. I sort of knew it, but it, it really crystallised with some uh, court matters this year, particularly on a Monday, where I spoke very strongly to the magistrate in a very loud and very firm voice. Uh, we'll get to that in due course. So, you're in your third estate, okay? But it doesn't matter. As the beneficiary, they have to provide benefit to your estate. And ultimately, it's up to you what's a benefit. But, again, you remain silent. So, unless you speak up and say, uh, I waive the benefit to my estate, or... I do not perceive a benefit to my estate. They're making the decision for you because you haven't made the decision as far as they're concerned. So with the guy with the smallpox vaccine, he's standing saying, well, he, clearly he doesn't think there's a benefit. The problem is, the whole time he's standing there, he's standing there as the administrator of his own estate. He hasn't presented himself to the court as the beneficiary. He's presented himself as the administrator. Uh, so, how has that happened? Well, he went. He, they said, are you John Doe? And he said, yes, eventually. He said, I am John Doe. Okay, I'm going to explain to you, I'm going to give you an example of a construction of law, because the construction of law is that if you say you're, you are John Doe, or that John Doe is your name, then what that um, relates to, I'm going to put my feet up, what, that, what, that, what the construction of law that occurs when you do that, the construction of law is you're the uh, you're claiming to be the administrator. Okay, that's the construction. So I'll give you a construction. The constructions of law are devious and nefarious, but constructions themselves aren't. So I'll give I'll explain. I'll give you just an everyday construction. If I said to you um, tomorrow I'm going to uh, meet my cousin. Okay. All right. So superficially. I've said I'm going to meet my cousin. But here is a construction that you can make from that statement. You can construct that either my mother or my father, potentially both, have a sibling, at least one. Because for me to have a cousin, then my mother or father have to have a brother or sister who then had a child. So... That's a construction that can be made from me saying, tomorrow I'm going to meet my cousin. And this is what the law does. When you give them a piece of information, they construct many other facts from that one piece of information. And that's the deception. So when you say, my name is John Doe, they construct from that that you are claiming to be the administrator. All right? So he's gone in and said, I'm John Doe, the administrator. Okay. Well, the administrator has a duty to administer the estate in accordance with the directions of the proper administrator of the estate, which is the government. Okay? Because they are in charge of the second estate. And they have issued a lot of instructions on how you're to administer the third estate. And alas, your mum and dad never issued any instructions on how the government was to administer your estate. So, this then creates uh, a conundrum. How do you identify as the beneficiary? Well, you could just say, I'm the beneficiary. They already know that. Uh, if you go in there and say, I'm John Doe, they presume you know what that means. And they presume you want to be treated as the administrator. And here's the, here's the really nasty twist. Uh, in, a, in a manner of speaking. Uh, so what they do is, uh, let's fast forward to, say, a speeding fine. So you've got a speeding fine, you're doing two kilometres over the speed limit of 60, so pretty harsh to be fined, but let's just assume they're going to fine you, all right? This is what's called a victimless crime, okay? There's no actual victim. Nevertheless, you're going to pay a price for it. And the reason you're going to pay a price is because there is a victim. And the victim is you. 
See, if you're speeding then, as, as the administrator, then what you're doing is putting at risk, according to their rules, they, they put the speed limit there to protect the beneficiary as a benefit to the beneficiary. By speeding, you have denied the beneficiary that benefit. So then the reason they're punishing you is they're punishing you on behalf of yourself. They're punishing you as the administrator on behalf of yourself as the beneficiary. And again, you're presumed to know all this. So they say, oh, I'm not, we're not responsible. We're just doing it for you. And if you didn't want us to do it, if you don't want us to punish yourself, you just have to tell us. Because you're the sovereign power of your own estate. So you just have to tell us not to punish you. But there's a trap. Of course there's a trap. Come on, these guys aren't honest. So, when they talk about waiving the benefit, in the case of the speeding fine, what, when you say, I waive the benefit, the benefit you're waiving, which, and this is what annoys me, I've heard waive the benefit, I first heard it four years ago, but no one could ever explain what they were talking about, because I don't think they knew. The benefit you're waiving is the benefit to your estate the benefit to you as beneficiary of the estate. So uh, you're being punished as administrator, So, and the punishment, like the fine, is then going to be paid into your estate for your benefit. That's how it works. And you might say, well, what's the point of that? Well, my, you know, they take money from me to give money to me. Well, the point of that is you, they know that... They, they know the truth and they know the fiction that they pretend is the case. You never claim your estate. Uh, so this goes to, you know, some people have said there's hundreds of millions of dollars in your estate. I don't know about that. Um, Romley Stewart, I think, has said that for those who know him and many others. I'm not sure if that's the case or not. I don't really care. If it is, great. If it's not, I don't care. What I do know in there is every cent you have paid for a victimless crime is in there and included in that is income tax because you're being taxed as the administrator for using the estate's good name and the tax is taken and held for the benefit of the beneficiary and then what do they do with that tax money well in australia they give you say medicare they say well you know they do provide some benefits one of the benefits is medicare So they say, well, you know, this, uh, this estate's got some money in it. There's income tax gone in there. There's some penalties from traffic infringements. There's some, I believe, stamp duty from transfers of land. Uh, you know, uh, all, all the money you pay where there's, where there's no uh, victim uh, or no, uh, no other party that you can identify. It's just a nebulous party. The nebulous party is yourself as the beneficiary. You are the nebulous party that's being paid. You are, you are the victim that's being compensated. Your estate's being compensated. So, uh, oh, but there's another trap, and I'll, I'll come to that, I think, now. I think I've got there. So this is the thing. You're in there, and the first thing you do when you identify as, yes, I'm John Doe, is that's, that's in, the, in law. You've just identified yourself as the administrator, okay? Okay. Uh, so then, uh, sorry, when I pause like this, I've had about four other thoughts, thoughts that I could explore, but I'm going to try and come back to those. Uh, so what's the key? What's the key? Well, you can waive the benefit, but, but let's cut it back. What's the crux of it? It's your estate. You decide what is a benefit to your estate and what is not. And uh, you decide what you want to pursue and what you don't. So there's plenty of times where someone will uh, uh, do something that you could potentially sue them for or take legal action, and often you don't. If you don't take action, it's presumed you forgive them. And that's what you need to do. Forgive yourself in court. 
Now, uh, I've sort of come to the trick, okay? So, waiving the benefit is effectively forgiving yourself, but I would be going the whole hog. I'd be saying, well, uh, so here's my spiel. Ballpark, okay? Uh, and, but then I've got to explain some very important words that you need to use. Uh, so, uh, are you John Doe? Yes, I am. Uh, all right. Uh, so you read the charges? Yes. Uh, I wish to say something. With respect to pleading, as the estate's administrator, I plead guilty. But as the estate's beneficiary, I wish to forgive myself. And so I wish to waive the benefit that would otherwise accrue to my estate. And your wish is his command. And that's the trap. So because you're both the administrator and the beneficiary, they have a bunch of rules that they, that they use to identify which one you are at any point in time. Because you're both all at once. It's like, uh, what do you call it when you split something? Um, not a duopoly. Um, what's that thing that they talk about? Duality? It's, du it's a duality. Um, uh, uh, and I don't know a lot about the duality, but, you know, it's probably um, a... Uh, um, I'd say this is probably Luciferian, but I, I don't know a lot about it. So, mate, I'm doing a recording. I tried to wave you off. Um, so, um, so I just had an interruption. That was the edit there. Uh, where was I? So it's a duality. Uh, People who've looked more into duality might know what that is. So you've been splitting two. How do they know who they're speaking to? Well, it's the language you use. So I'll tell you the language that a uh, administrator says uses. It's, I want and I would like. That is, that's the language of a supplicant to a superior. Okay? The language of a uh, uh, beneficiary, a sovereign... It's the same language the Queen and the royal families use. The Queen said she's not using any language anymore. Nevertheless, it's the same language royalty uses. And what do they use? They say, it is my wish. It is my will. It is my pleasure. Or you can hit them with all of it. It is my wish, my will, and my pleasure. So what you need to do is say, I wish. You can say, I plead guilty as the administrator, but as the estate's beneficiary, I wish... To forgive myself. If you say, I want to forgive myself, you've just, as soon as you use the word want, they, they use that to say you've become the administrator again, and it's not going to work. That's the, that's the real guts of the deception there. You can know about the administrator, you can know about the beneficiary. If you don't know how to speak like a, like a beneficiary, like a sovereign, they're going to treat you like the administrator. And I've heard this. I heard a video on this years ago, and I kept it in the back of my mind. One guy was saying that he had uh, people who were doing this, and it was going really well. And then the magistrate said, uh, "So, what would you like me to do for you?" And they said, "Well, we'd like you to." And as soon as, according to him, as soon as they said that, he said, "Arrest those people," and the bailiff moved in and grabbed them because they said like. And when they said like, they immediately morphed back into the administrators, and they were guilty and in trouble. So that's how much it twinges on the words you use. Okay? So the key, and that's, this is something we have to do, because we were all taught from, in good faith by our parents to, to say, can I please have, or I w would like, or I want. But that's not how a sovereign expresses, them, expresses themselves. And I would suggest that a lot of the training the royal families get is to Use the correct language always. You always express your wish, your will, and your pleasure. So, as I said, the, the language, I w it to be the beneficiary. So, admit you're the administrator, because the case won't start till you do. So, just say, um, uh, yeah, as the estate's administrator, I plead guilty. But as the estate's beneficiary, I wish to forgive myself. And I wish to waive the benefit that would otherwise accrue to my estate. Now, once you've said that, stay in 
the guise of the beneficiary. And if he asks you anything else, just say, you have your instructions and I wish you to act on them immediately. A lot of the time what I'll try and do is delay it. So I think we'll, so I'll say things like, oh, I've heard this one done. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll leave this matter till later in the day. Just say, you have your instructions and I wish you to instruct, you can say this, you, look, it's up to you what you say, but you don't want to go, don't get too cocky. Take it steady, okay? Um, don't get too cocky till you've done this like many times. And just say, um, what was it? I wish you to conclude the matter immediately. If you say wish, that's a command to him. Say, and then just say, you have your instructions, do your duty. And, but you must stay in. And no matter what he says then, don't answer any questions. Just say, I, I do not wish to say anything further. You have your instructions, do your duty. Always wish, wish, wish. So, you have your instructions, do your duty. And then if you do stumble, if, like in that example where they said, where he said, what would you like me to do? And they said, oh, well, we'd like you to. If, he, if something happens, you can become the beneficiary in a split second. Just say, forgive me. I do not wish you to take any action against the administrator. And right there, you're back in charge again. It is like a magician's court. It's the word, the, and the words are magical, and they have power. They've decided what words mean in that place, and if you use the wrong ones, you land yourself in a world of trouble. If you use the right ones, you're in command. So it's like he's a magician and you're a magician, and it's a, it's a battle of magicians who is going to win. The way to win is to keep it simple, particularly when you're starting out. Okay? Uh, so know that you will have made a mistake if you, use, if you express that you want or like something. Okay? And if you make a mistake and you do get in a bit of trouble, just forgive yourself. Whatever they could come say, you're, you're, you're going to be charged with contempt of court, blah, 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 blah. Just say, uh, forgive me. As the beneficiary, I wish for the administrator to be forgiven. Okay? Just forgive, forgive, forgive. Forgive yourself. You, the beneficiary, forgive you, the, the administrator. Because most of you are Mr. Miss or Mrs. So most of you are administering your estates unlawfully. And uh, those who have a lawful appointment uh, are still bound by the, the rules and the regulations. You're just slightly better off than the ones who are doing it unlawfully. Because the unlawful ones, they can find you guilty anytime they want. Because no matter, even if they didn't speed, even if they got it wrong, you're still administering the estate unlawfully. So you're guilty of that. Okay. Um, so anyway, uh, that's the crux of it there, folks, is that uh, they've set up an estate for you. You're the beneficiary. You never express your will because you don't know you're the beneficiary and you don't know there's an estate. And uh, you always act as the administrator, which gives them power over you. But even though you're in the third estate, you still have the power as the beneficiary. But that's the only way you have power, as the beneficiary. And the beneficiary expresses themselves in the same manner that royalty does. Wish means will. And wish, it's, uh, no, the hints are there. Aladdin, your wish is my command. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so wish, will and pleasure are command, order and instruction to... Coming from you, you express them as your wish, your will, and your pleasure. But to one who serves you, like the administrator, like the, and the magistrate is administering your estate, that is his command, order, and instruction. It leaves your lips as your wish, will, and pleasure, and it hits his ear as a command, order, and instruction. Okay? Uh, the prosecutor is also administering your estate. He's the one bringing the case against you for the benefit of your estate. 
So this is the other other thing, and I'll probably touch a bit on um, uh, the case I had. So um, my wife was was in there for a minor uh, traffic offence, shall we say? And uh, I've been trying to encourage her to do this, and because uh, I've been doing it quite successfully for some time, but starting with little things and building up. And, I, and that's what I suggest you start with something small. Uh, don't start, don't dive in the deep end. So uh, anyway, uh, so she has appointed me as her lawful administrator by her will and pleasure, so the beneficiaries appointed me by her will and pleasure, over and above all other administrators. And then she has issued me a um, perpetual pardon so if anyone says I'm in breach, there's already a written instruction from the beneficiary that I'm to be pardoned, to be forgiven, not to be punished. That is her will and pleasure. So that way I've set up a situation where I can't be touched, okay? And I can still operate with a fair bit of latitude. Because, because of the forgiveness that she has um, granted me, and it covers past, present and future, uh, I, I now have the protection that the beneficiary can supply. Uh, it's the same as, as a royal pardon. Same thing. It's her estate. She is the sovereign. It's this sovereign citizen thing. It's more like um, sovereign administrator than sovereign citizen. So the, the beneficiary is the sovereign power of the estate. The uh, administrator is the citizen, okay? If you want to put it like that, but I wouldn't. I just say, beneficiary, who is the sovereign power, administrator, who owes a duty to do everything they're instructed by the beneficiary, if, if it's within their power. I mean, you can't instruct yourself to kill people. You know, got, got to be sensible here, folks. Um, but you have the, as a beneficiary, you have the sovereign power over everyone who administers your estate, the police. But you've got to be sensible. They don't know what's going on. They're clueless. So you're really best to save the big moves for uh, court. And you don't even have to go. Everything I've just said, you can put in a letter. You know, you can, you can put in a defence in writing, unless it's a really serious matter where they are dragging you in there. So just write a letter. Just say, um, with, re with respect to the matter, blah, 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 put all the details in. Um, it is my wish that uh, the administrator, who is the defendant, be forgiven. And I waive the benefit that, all, that would otherwise accrue to my estate. And then you just sign it and you, you put your legal name and you sign under the legal name and then under the signature you put per the beneficiary. So P-E-R, full colon, the beneficiary. That way, if you've used the word wish, make sure you use the word wish, or you can use will or pleasure. They all, they're all, they're all commands from a sovereign. So you use wish, will, and pleasure to issue your inst your instructions to them, and you sign it. You sign it using the legal name, and you put your signature. But then under your signature, you put per colon the beneficiary, and that makes it absolutely crystal clear who it's coming from. All right, uh, and then wait and see what happens. Now, here's what will happen. I can tell you because I've been through this. So what happens when you do that is that um, they will they will uh, file, they'll stamp it with filed at the court when it, when they receive it, but then they'll send it back to you and they'll say um, this does not represent a defence, and uh, if you wish to defend the matter, you need to either present a defence in writing. So they'll write it back to the legal name. When they write it to the legal name, they're not writing to the beneficiary. So they'll keep a copy on the court file and then they will, this is a bluff, they're always trying to bluff you, and then they will, um, so this is the thing, if you don't get this right, I'm telling you you've been bluffed, because I've done this successfully, all right, and I'll get into that a bit sooner, it's going to be cool here, um, anyway, so what they'll do is they will send it back to you and make it seem like it was a waste of time, you achieve nothing with that. Because what they, but they, when they send it back, they won't send it back to the beneficiary. They'll just send it back to the legal name, which is their attempt to deceive you. And so what they want you to do is offer a defence, because then they can 
manipulate you. When they send back and say, um, and if they'll say, if you don't offer a defence, then a, then a default judgment uh, may be entered against you. All right? So just ignore it. That's what I did. I did it on uh, land rates. So, and we're talking like six to seven grand of uh, outstanding land rates. So I draft the letter which uh, said that uh, um, I do not wish you to uh, uh, proceed in this matter. Um, rather, what I wish you to do is to pay the outstanding amount and I wish you to access the funds with which the outstanding amount is to be paid from the Commissioner of Taxation. Because he's been administering this. Well, I didn't put that. That's what I said, just from the Commissioner of Taxation. So I said, no, I want it paid. No, 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 you've got to pay this. I'm not, I'm not saying don't pay it. I'm saying I want this paid. I'm saying I don't want you to administer this um, and, and make a judgment on it. What I want you to do is tell the Commissioner of Taxation to pay it. Okay. So that was paperwork was all filed on the 9th of January. Uh, the case was due for hearing on the 16th. There was no defence offered. Okay, I've been through this before some years earlier, doing the same thing, where I was just testing it. Uh, in that case, I just wanted to see what would happen. They issued a default judgment for outstanding rates on the same property. Uh, rates are land taxes. As we call them rates in Australia. They're, they're, they're your land and property taxes. Anyway, um, they issued this in... Uh, oh, I don't know. They, they issued it, sorry. Going back to the original one, it goes... Not this one I'm talking about now, one that I did like five, six years earlier. Um, they issued a default judgment and you got within, a, within two to three days you got a notice of default judgment in the mail that you had to pay a certain amount by a certain day and if you didn't the sheriff would come out and start taking stuff. So I just paid it because I was just testing the system. Okay. All right. So then the 16th of January was uh, the date for the hearing. Uh and no, no defence was offered, so what should have happened is they should have issued a default judgment, OK? Uh, and then we should have got a, a letter within two to three days uh, saying that a default judgment's been issued against you for the sum that was claimed by the council, and you have to pay this amount by such and such a date, or the sheriff's coming. Well, it's now, what is it, nearly the end of April, and we haven't received, we haven't heard boo. Which means, because of the other things I put in there, I don't think they even, they just told them, like, we can't hear this case. Because I gave them instructions as a beneficiary on how I wanted my estate administered. So, what they've done, I believe, is uh, just said, we're not going to administer this case at all. We can't, we can't hear it. Sorry. So now the council's stuck. They can't get their money. There's no way they'll get it ever. There's no way for them to get it because the instructions are there. Uh, pay it, get the money from the Commissioner of Taxation. <coughs> uh, and if not from him, someone else, the Secretary of the Treasury, who, whoever. Um, I have a particular dislike for the Commissioner of Taxation because of his uh, mendacity, which means his deliberate deception on other matters, like providing a definition of income and other things. So... I thought I'd start with him just because he, he yeah, yeah. That's a whole other thing. Um, I, I, he's never got anything out of me, and he won't. Um, in fact, I've drafted a letter. I'm going to write to him and say, uh, as the beneficiary, and say, um, I don't require, I no longer require you to administer this estate. Um, I wish to forgive the, the administrator, me. I wish to forgive myself. Uh, and... Any outstanding matters to, are to be dropped. Anything that, that is outstanding, I don't wish you to pursue uh, against the administrator. He has my total forgiveness. Uh, and I wish you to make the funds you're holding on behalf of my estate available to me within a, within X amount of time frame. And I want a full accounting of your administration within 60 days. Now, the Commissioner of Taxation hasn't had the guts to come near me for about four years. Um, and that's just based on me asking, I didn't know this, and so uh, that was just based on me asking questions he would not want to answer in a court of law, uh, like where's your definition of income? 
and I'm not going to tolerate this nonsense of, well, there's a definition of assessable income, and it's assessable income includes income. Right, so that doesn't define income. That defines assessable. You can't define a word using the word. I can't say uh, tree means a tree. Whatever I say after that is irrelevant. I haven't told you what a tree is at all. And saying accessible income means income that is blah, blah, blah. Well, all the blah, blah, blah is just defining what the term accessible means. It's not defining what the term income means. Anyway, that's a particular um, annoyance that I have that they... Because uh, ha- I've got them. I've, I've got them. But they just dodge and weave. So they don't want to come near me because... Um, uh, they don't want to answer the questions that I will definitely be asking. Uh, but I didn't know this, but I, I showed enough uh, that uh, um, I, I thought, well, this, this could get ugly if it... I mean, you know, it, I didn't know, as I said, I didn't know everything I know now, so perhaps I would have tripped myself up. But uh, it, it, the situation is they wouldn't want to um, take the risk of exposure. So... At times like that, they cut their losses and run. They just say, oh, just don't leave that one. Whoever's been following, just drop that one. We're not going to follow it. If you work in the tax office, ask yourself if that's ever happened, if you're in that sort of area. You get told to drop something. Why? Why should this guy not have to pay tax if everyone else does? Because this guy knows a few things and we're worried about what might be exposed if we push too hard. So we'll, we'll cut our losses. You, gotta, you can't win them all. It's like gambling. We win most of the hands. Every now and then the house loses. We'll, we'll take that one on the chin because otherwise the whole house might come down. Uh, so, what have we got? So the thing is, the thing to take away from this is you have an estate, you're in your third estate. Uh, like the angels in Jude who left their first estate, I would say the first estate they left was their estate under the authority of God. And they moved into a state, an estate under the authority of Lucifer slash Satan, whatever you want to, whoever you want to believe. They they abandoned their first estate and took themselves over to another estate, which was inferior. Um, everyone pretty much has left their first estate except royal households. Uh, you can you can, but if you know what's going on, you can operate successfully in the third estate. So all you need to do, so with COVID, if you didn't want to wear a mask, all you needed to do was um, write to someone, uh, whoever you thought was the appropriate authority that was issuing that order, and just say, uh, as the beneficiary, always as the beneficiary, and say, um, uh, I don't know, what would you say? Uh, With respect to your ordinance that uh, masks be worn to protect people from COVID, I find that such is not a not. I do not consider such to be a benefit to my estate, and so and so I do not wish this ordinance to be applied to my estate or any administrator of my estate. That covers yourself as administrator and as beneficiary. Also, a good idea to um, give yourself a pardon. Again, you have to do it as the beneficiary. You have to pardon yourself as administrator as the beneficiary. And make a perpetual. Police pull you over, hand them a notice saying, um, you know, uh, I wish I wish it to be known that I forgive absolutely, you're putting your legal name, um, John Doe, the administrator, uh, for all acts done, past, present and future, in administration of my estate. Uh, I, uh, I wish to waive the, all benefit that would otherwise accrue to my estate. Uh, such is my wish, my will and my pleasure. And then for good measure, add something along the lines of... Uh, I wish it to be known that any party, having viewed this notice, who proceeds to, administer, to continue to administer my estate against the administrator, does so unlawfully. That is, disson tort and acts outside of their office and stands naked before the law. And then you sign it, legal name, signature, per, colon, the beneficiary.
Now, if you do that, I don't think you'll have a drama. Uh, with respect to my, oh, with respect to the case last week, about a week ago, uh, the magistrate was quite belligerent and didn't do his duty properly. Um, and I was speaking to him very firmly over an extended period. So at one, so I'll try and emulate the tone and the strength of voice I used speaking to him. So he said, um, please be quiet, sir. And I turned to him and said, no, you be quiet. And that's what I said in a court of law to the magistrate. Many other things beside. Uh, I spoke at that pitch for about a minute straight. All right. Now, in the end, he was just being belligerent. So uh, we did we did leave. But here's the here's the important thing. At no point, me speaking to a magistrate like that, did he even mention contempt of court. Now, this is the thing. They're not going to roll over and go, "Oh, you got us. We give up." It's not going to happen. You have to read the things that are done and the things that aren't done. How did I walk out of that court without a contempt of court charge? Without a contempt of court even being threatened? Not even threatened. So, um, and I've now pursued, I decided that, that no, I didn't want to go any further with, with him. At that point, I've now written a letter. Well, I've written a, a letter which has been signed by the beneficiary. I drafted it, um, and I suspect he'll wet his pants. But he won't tell me. He'll probably double down. I mean, at some point, it's like the COVID, isn't it? You just keep doubling down and hope it'll go away. Uh, I don't know. You never know. He might... Uh, he, might uh, he was offered the opportunity to offer a defence or offer a remedy, OK? Uh, if he does, uh, my wife's fairly gentle... Um, Oh, she'll be guided by me, and I'm, I, I, you know, he was. I didn't like the guy. He was. I watched him doing other cases, and he was. I mean, I could tell. I, I was sitting there. I could tell he was. It's all pantomime. No, oh, no one other thing. No one other thing. Sorry, pantomime, an important thing. Um, after you say all that as the beneficiary, what is going to happen if if you if you issue those instructions as a beneficiary? and you don't let him delay it till later, and you require him to deal with it right now um, in your power as beneficiary. If you do that, what's then going to happen is you're going to be treated to a bit of pantomime, okay? Don't be deceived. He's going to hum and haw and say, well, in the consideration of this, and because your record is so good, and because it's a lucky day, and because I'm, you know, I won at the pokies last night, and because... I'm in a good mood, and because of this, and the sun is in the sky, and all is beautiful in the world, I have decided that I will instruct the prosecutor to withdraw this case. That's all pantomime, to make you think that uh, you got his favour. All right? Don't be sucked in. Know that it's a show. In the first instance, it's a show for everyone else in the room. So they don't think... What's going on? What just happened here? He wants them to go back to sleep. So, number one, the pantomime will be put on for everyone else, even if you don't buy it. But it's also a pantomime for you. If he can make you think that the reason you didn't get fined is because he's a good bloke and he looked after you, well, then he's had, he's had a victory. And you might be dumb enough to go into court next time and think, well, he's a good bloke, I don't need to do all that stuff. They'll, they'll do the right thing, and then you'll get hammered because they want to teach you a lesson, because they don't like it when they get caught. So expect the pantomime afterwards, all right? But, uh, I mean, I've got a few ideas. You don't want to go too far the first time, you know. Just uh, have it all written out. Write it all out. You don't have to go in there and ad lib it. You can write it all down. The main thing is you say, yes, I'm John Doe. Uh, I wish to say something. Use the word wish. Okay, and then say, as the administrator, I plead guilty. But as the beneficiary, I wish to forgive myself. I waive the benefit that would otherwise accrue to my estate from prosecuting the administrator. 
And now I wish you to conclude this matter immediately, without any delay. And then if he says, well, we might, we might leave it till later this afternoon. If you don't say anything, this, this is, I've got an example of an Australian woman who did this, but um, he said, well, we're just going to, um, this is just a motion and we're going to have the final hearing, you know, we'll do it next, in a couple of weeks. That's what he said. And she just stood there. So that's what they did. Because she just gave tacit consent. Consent by silence. He was asking her permission. She never realised it. So she came back in two weeks and the thing started and straight away the prosecutor stood up and said, uh, Your Honour, the prosecution withdraws. And the Honour goes, Thank you very much. Goodbye, everybody. And they bolted out of the room, basically. They basically, it was all over. It was just a you know bit of hoo-ha. All right? So there'll be pantomime. He'll try to delay it. He's looking for another opportunity to get to you. You don't want to muck around. You've, you've got your spiel. You've hit him with what he needs to do. Now take charge. You've, you've identified you're in charge. Once you, once you identify as the beneficiary and make sure you stay in the role of the beneficiary. You're playing a role too. It's beneficiary and it's your wish, your will and your pleasure. It's not I would like or I want. Don't answer questions. You don't have to answer any questions. You've just said, it's like you're the queen or the king. You've just said, this is done. I forgive. Let's get out of here. There's no point. There's nothing else to sort out. There is nothing else to sort out. And you need to get that in your head. Once the beneficiary has, has expressed their will to any administrator, it's all done. And any administrator who continues to administer the estate contrary to the will of the beneficiary is now outside the protection of their own office. And as I said, stands naked before the law. They don't have the protection of their office. Okay. By the way, that protection, if you know anything about trusts, the trustee is indemnified by the estate and its assets. But if they act unlawfully, they lose that indemnification. So that's why they're naked before the law. They have to pay if they keep going. Okay. You need to practice this, folks, too. You don't want to just walk in and think, oh, yeah, I'll rattle that off. You, you wait till you're there. Um, it's quite intimidating. I'll watch this guy. He's just a... Oh, kept the language clean. He was, um, he had this young guy who'd done the wrong thing, definitely. Uh, oh, maybe he thought he was doing a good job. Who knows? But this guy's trembling. He's just shaking like this. He's doing 120 in a 60k zone, and he probably needed a slap up the side of the head to keep him in order, because that's just stupid behaviour. But he's got, I thought this guy was going to pee his pants. He was, I could, oh, we were behind him, and you could see the muscles in his back trembling as this guy says, well, what are we talking about, you know, suspension of licence for? I'm, I'm, I'm looking at a jail term. And this guy's like wetting himself. This guy probably justifies what he does, though, on the basis that uh, I'm doing the right thing. But I say, I don't, I don't cotton to that. Two, two wrongs don't make a right. And uh, the ends do not justify the means, as far as I'm concerned. If you do things properly correctly, lawfully, morally, you'll get to the right result. It might take longer, it might be a tougher road, but you'll get there. Anyway, that's a fundamental difference, I suppose, that I have with some. Uh, so, yeah, that's pretty much it. As I said, with, with the rates, they're done now. I know uh, that they can't ever collect. There's nothing they can do. If they go to court, the, the, the beneficiaries already issued her instructions. That's going to stop them dead in their tracks every time. Uh, what they should consider is whether in, in 12 years, after they've failed to collect any rates, whether um, a, a claim for a lodial title in adverse position comes forward. That's something they should consider. Anyway, um, so uh, I'm still pursuing that. Uh, getting it paid by the commissioner. Uh, I need to figure out why they feel that they can just ignore the beneficiary's instructions. Perhaps they, they're claiming that they didn't step into the office of administrator, so um, as they haven't technically put their foot into the... They haven't sat their bum on the administrator's seat or wherever they want it, like they're just hovering above it, and then they stood straight up as soon as they got the instructions from the, uh, 
from the beneficiary so that they did, didn't have to act. Uh, so maybe their claim is, well, we never actually... We were going to be the administrator, but we never actually were. I don't know if that's what's going on. I have to just... The only way to figure this stuff out is to poke and prod. So I needed to go to court for this so I could figure a few things out. I had been working on the basis that uh, just don't be the administrator at all. Uh, only be the beneficiary, which you probably can do. But um, I see now that if you forgive yourself, you can continue to use the legal name. Just forgive yourself. Now, I don't know how this would go in other situations like, say, a murder trial where you've killed somebody. I suspect, though, uh, it would work to a point. I suspect that that will force them back to common law. They certainly can't use... I don't believe they can't use their statutes because the statutes are, are for the administrators of an estate. If you forgive the administrator as the beneficiary... I think that they then can't use their statutes and it, the court would have to convene in common law. So that's how you would probably get back to common law. Uh, but where you're the victim, as the beneficiary, you can just get the whole thing that, withdrawn. Just instruct the prosecutor to withdraw. Instruct the magistrate to instruct the prosecutor to withdraw. Uh, anyway, that's where I'm at with it. As to the date of birth thing too, um, when I did the... Um, Christ identity versus legal identity video. Um, I did say that was speculation. I, I still think it may well be what's going on, but with respect to the estate, I'm wondering now if perhaps it's not a deceased estate, if it's just an estate. You, not, all estates don't need to be deceased estates. So perhaps it's not a deceased estate, perhaps you aren't dead. And that then leads me to a different conclusion of why they want the date of birth. And that was what I got in court when I sat down and figured out what happened in court last week. Uh, see, the magistrate said to me, um, I'm going to use a different name, not my wife's name, but at one point the magistrate said, he said, I don't have any standing. And I said, I have the standing of the beneficiary. And I turned and I pointed to my wife because she'd introduced herself as the beneficiary only. She hadn't, she hadn't, at that point, I wanted her to be the beneficiary only. She hadn't said she was the administrator. So he did the old, the administrator's not here, so I'll enter a plea. Uh, but he never properly acknowledged the beneficiary, which I think is going to bite him in the bum. But we'll see. Um, I'm pretty confident, though. So, but anyway, he underestimated what I knew. And so uh, he tried to trick me. And so he said, uh, you know, I'm saying I'm, I'm representing the beneficiary. That edit is because I used my wife's actual name, and so I'm now going to do it again, not using my wife's actual name, that's about the fourth time I've done that. Uh, I did it three times outside and thought, oh, I'm just going to go inside to finish. Uh, I think you can understand why I would want to keep that private at this point. Um, anyway, we'll try again. So, what I've said five times now, but this time I'll try and use Jane Doe. Uh, so, he said to me, the magistrate, he said, well, you don't have any standing in this case. And I turned and I pointed to my wife and I said, I have the beneficiary standing. And he said, well, well you're not Jane Doe, though. You're not, come on, you're not Jane Doe. And that was like an uh, electric shock. Because instantly, I turned back and I stared him straight in the face and I said, yes, I am Jane Doe. And this document evidences that I am Jane Doe. Now, I didn't hear anything else. I was, like, laser-focused. Uh, one of my sons who was there says that there was laughter in the courtroom when I said that. But all really nervous laughter because I'm told I sometimes am somewhat of an intimidating figure. And when I express myself in a strong voice, uh, I think there it would have been nervous laughter. Here's the thing. I, I, in that moment, I was Jane Doe. Because Jane Doe means administrator of the estate. He was asking me, deceptively, to trick me. He assumed I would say, no, I'm not Jane Doe. That was a, a, a trick he was trying to use. He clearly didn't expect that I would say, yes, I am Jane Doe. Getting back to the date of birth. In that courtroom, 
I'm Jane Doe, the administrator. My wife is Jane Doe, the beneficiary. The magistrate is Jane Doe, the magistrate, and the prosecutor is Jane Doe, the prosecutor. So when you're looking for Jane Doe, what you should be looking for, well, the way to identify the correct Jane Doe, you'll need something else, like a date of birth. Because he's Jane Doe, the prosecutor's Jane Doe, I'm Jane Doe, my wife is Jane Doe, but she's the beneficiary. Technically, the three of us are Jane Doe. She's not Jane Doe, she's the beneficiary of Jane Doe. Okay? I am Jane Doe. He is Jane Doe. The prosecutor's Jane Doe. There's three of us. I haven't made a final determination on the clerk of the court, whether the clerk is also Jane Doe. Possibly is, but... So there's multiple Jane Doe's in the room, and normally they would expect my wife to admit being Jane Doe. So to distinguish between all the Jane Doe's in a courtroom at one time, they need to do it with a date of birth. So that's my other um, hypothesis. I'm not saying that's absolutely determined what the date of birth is about. I still think the, what I suggested in um, Christ Identity v. Legal Identity may be what it's about. But I also then thought, well, hang on. If we're all here being Jane Doe, how do you tell... We you know, because because of the word salad game, they like to play to keep everyone in the dark. How do we know which Jane Doe we're talking about? Well, the only other way is to distinguish them by date of birth and potentially address. So um, the magistrate is Jane Doe with a different date of birth and with a different address than what they would normally expect my wife to claim to be Jane Doe, who has her date of birth and her data, uh, her address, okay? So it may be that the date of birth and the address are being used to tell which Jane Doe is being spoken of in any particular moment. Okay? So just raising that, as I said, when I did the cross at any universal legal identity, I said it was speculative. Um, I was working on the idea that the estate was definitely deceased. I'm now wondering if maybe it's not. Uh, so... It does, in the end, it doesn't matter in terms of getting a result. You'll get the result if you identify as uh, the beneficiary and stay in the, in the role of beneficiary by expressing yourself as a beneficiary. Because moment to moment, you can be flicking back and forth. When you're in court with someone who knows what's going on, you can be hopscotching between both roles moment to moment just by the language you use. You could have a lot of fun with it if you are a master of it, a master of the language and the, and the fraud. But I'm just saying, he, they can look at you and uh, in, in, at one moment they're looking at you and, they're, and he's saying, right, she's in. And when, I, when um, my wife, um, when, they, when he called Jane Doe, is Jane Doe here? I'd already written out a script for it. And the script was, I'm here on that matter. And he motioned her forward to the microphone. She got there, mucked around. And then the script I gave her was, uh, he said, so you Jane Doe? And my wife said, Jane Doe is my legal name and I am the beneficiary. When she said, and I am the beneficiary, he, like that, laser focused in. As soon as she said it, it was like, whoa, I've got to be on the game here. I've got to be listening carefully because if she says want and like, I've got her. If she says will and pleasure and wish, then she's still the beneficiary. So he's now, suddenly he's paying attention. Like he's sitting back like I am now, taking it easy. I'm going to send you to jail, son. All this sort of hoo-ha. He's really making a big song and dance about the whole, every case that came before him, you know. Um, it was, I, I already saw the pantomime, what he'd done to other people. Um, I probably would have been taken in if I was... 20, and probably would have bothered me. I would have thought about the hanging judge. But he threatened big, and then everyone got pretty lenient results, I thought. Uh, all the things he threatened. Like he said, he did send the kid to jail, and it was jail, but not prison. It's jail at home. It's Basically, the jail he sent him to is, you're on a bond. Because <laughs> that's jail. Uh, so the bond is, is jail. So he never went in. You know, anyway. Uh, so he put him on a bond, effectively. But he called it, I'm sent this is a jail sentence, but it's a bond. Um, so, you know, uh, 
I'd already seen the pantomime, um, so that didn't surprise me. But he was laser focused once my wife said, and I am the beneficiary. And then she wanted to say, I wish this man, and she put her hand on my shoulder, I wish this man to represent, I might have some of the words wrong here, I wish this man to represent my, to represent my estate, and I wish the court to direct themselves to him on all matters. And then she went and sat down. Okay? So that's, she's just said, I'm her representative. Okay? It's not up to them to decide who represents, represents her. Um, it's, she can decide who's going to represent her. Okay? Uh, they say you have to be a solicitor, but that's only when you're the administrator. In, as the beneficiary, you get to decide everything that happens with your estate. It's, I mean, you can't t- tell them to go and kill your enemies or nonsense like that. You're the sovereign of your own estate, your own property. Okay? You're not the sovereign of other people. You can't tell other people what to do. But you can tell anyone administering your estate what to do with respect to your estate. Alright? Now, there's a difference too when you talk contracts. If you've entered a, a contract... So that's, I'm talking about anything to do with government. Anything that involves a government, that, where it's a government department is what I'm talking about. It's going to be a different matter if you've signed a contract where you agreed to buy a car from someone and now you want to get out of it. Uh, yeah, that's not going to work, I don't think. But anything where it's, as I said, where you look around and say, well, who's the victim here? Like In that case, it would be the guy selling you the car if you try to pull out of a contract you made. He's the victim. But when you look around and you can't identify a victim, it's because you're the victim. And so then you've got to say, well, I don't have to prosecute myself. They're prosecuting you because you've never said you don't want to prosecute yourself. Do I have anything else? Uh, so this is really long. It's going to take ages for it to upload. Um, listen, here's where I'm at. Uh, I'm, I'm located in... Uh, Northeast Victoria, okay, southern New South Wales. Uh, if people want to uh, organise something uh, and have me give a talk to them, for example, uh, if someone wants to get a little seminar going or something like that, I, I'm happy to consider that, uh, depending how it's set up. I just not interested in doing all the technical stuff. I don't want to, um, you know, I've got a lot, a lot more to say. It's just that um, I don't really want to spend endless hours editing videos. It's a long task. I've pretty much got it for myself, and I was doing it mainly for myself and just sharing what I know. Uh, but if people want to be instructed on this, I'm happy to teach it. Uh, but someone else would have to organise that, okay? So someone could organise that. I don't want to travel a long way either. People would have to come to where I am. Uh, but I'm happy to consider. I'm not saying I'll do it. I'm just saying, so if someone in the comments section wants to organise, I don't care if it's on the internet, but you're going to have to help me with uh, um, setting up. I don't have a webcam. I, I barely manage to do these videos, okay? So if someone wants to do that, if someone thinks the information is valuable enough, they want more detail on how to do things, uh, I'm happy to consider that. Uh, That would have to be a discussion. Where, when, how, all the rest of it. Do I have a good enough equipment to do it? All that sort of stuff. I'm I'm still running Windows 7 uh, on a computer that's probably eight years old, you know, uh, and that doesn't bother me, but you're sort of falling off the back end of the technology level in order to do, you know, online conferencing or any of that sort of stuff. So if someone's prepared to um, do that and thinks the information is good enough, I'm prepared to do it. Um, Like I said, 
I think I've said before, I, I suspect, I, I started getting into this, and I could see that there was the potential for something to be there, but I could also see there was seemed to be a lot of nonsense mixed in with it. And so my big concern, even with organising a group, is, is that uh, if some government operative is, is clued in, they might try and uh, destroy it from within. So it'd have to be pretty informal in, in a way. Um, I don't know. I don't know if there's a level of interest. I don't know. Uh, anyway, it's, a, it's something I'm willing to consider, but I'm, that, that doesn't mean I'm going to say yes. You'd, you'd have to sort of suggest a format, organise people to set it all up, and then we could discuss it um, and see if, it, if everyone's content with it. I, I'm happy to do a, a collective collaborative thing. Uh, I'm pretty confident though, I, like as I said, the rates one, it's, and it's more than that, the total rates outstanding are like 15, 16 grand. They only went for the oldest portion, okay, which was about six. I, I haven't paid them because I wanted this to happen. I wanted this to go to court so I could do something. Uh, I'm probably at the point now where I need to learn how to take it to court myself. So at this point, I've let them come at me and take things to court. There's other things I've got, you know, in Australia, I'm, I'm rambling on again. If you had enough, tune out now. I'm just going to talk about some other things that I've done. I'm going to put my feet up. Like I said, I'm not going to... Um, I'm just going to relax and do this now. Uh... Particularly as BitChute doesn't keep it, I, I wanted this to be a um, perpetual record of the research I've done. But all the old videos on BitChute. See, someone could do that for me. If someone wants to um, re-edit and uh, upload, it'd be nice. I'd like to do this really professionally, uh, but it takes someone who's got the professional uh, abilities and a lot of setting up and editing and all the rest of it. And I'm, I've already done it once, and I just. Not sure I have the. I have the energy. If I if, if I thought it was worthwhile, um, I, I think. Uh, might be blind man trying, but I think my research is better than anyone's that I've seen. I'm not sure. That, I'm not saying there's no one else that who couldn't could do it, but you know, other people get in. They talk in generalities. I get very specific. Like I said, I've heard. I've been hearing for about four or five years. Um, Way the benefit. What benefit? As I said, it's the benefit is you prosecuting yourself to get a benefit back into your to your estate. So the benefit is you, the beneficiary, gets a benefit by you, the administrator, getting fined, and that fine coming into your estate. Of course, you never access that benefit because you don't know how to. Uh, and whether there's more, whether there's millions, you know, I've heard that. I don't know. Is there? Maybe. You might find that the bankers are somehow using that. Um, and uh, I remember, I do remember, um, I said this would be a ramble. What was his? Costello. Peter Costello was the treasurer. And he was telling Australians that have, have more kids. Have one for mum, one for dad, and one for the country. Well, what I take that to mean is that... Uh, um, so as mum and dad die, they have to be replaced, okay? When mum and dad die, whatever funds the bankers might have issued, and this is all speculative, I'm not saying this is what's happening, I'm, this is just what I thought about it when, when he said it. I thought, okay, when mum and dad die, the bankers would withdraw any credit they'd advanced for mum and dad because they're no longer here to, provide, to be of any value to the bankers. So you need to replace mum and dad that's why one for mum, one for dad, so we, so we maintain our credit. And then one for the country, so we get access to more credit. So we're growing the credit supply by expanding the population. Um, so, you know, that, that was what struck me there. Um, so just a lot of little things like that that could mean something. Uh, don't have to. So when, and when they expand the credit supply, that would be credit they'd put into your estate. I would think. So it's gone into your estate. You can access it. But 
because you never do, the government relies on you not accessing it, and I would suggest that they use that to fund their programs. And, it, oh, I never haven't mentioned this, have I? Why are they doing all this if it's all for you? Well, they take fees out of it. The court, everyone who administers your estate, the police, the court, all these people are living off you. They're living off your estate. So if the international bankers put $20 million into your um, estate as credit, uh, then uh, that's yours. But they also know you'll never claim it because you don't know it exists. So the government then uses that to do things. And the magistrates get paid out of that. The prosecutor gets paid out of that. Uh, now, when I say the magistrate, the court system gets paid. And they get paid based on what they do. Uh, but the magistrate will get a salary, of course. But effectively, the services that the magistrate supplies to your estate uh, are going to result in a fee being charged to your estate, which you'll never know or see about. You hear about or know about that it's happened because you don't know anything about your estate. So that's that's where the police get paid from, that's where the magistrate gets paid from, that's where the commissioner of taxation and all the people employed there get paid from. They're all robbing you and taking taking their salaries out and fees out of your estate. And they put the money into your estate and when you die, all of that goes back to the administrators, so the government, and then they go around and do it again. Um, so the other thing is an unlawful administrator doesn't get to charge a fee. So if um, so, that's see, as the administrator, you're in, as an administrator, you're entitled to get paid, but not if you're Mister, not if you're unlawful. Then you're not entitled to get paid. Uh, so another way of dealing with it is. Uh, if you just want to go with proper name, you can walk into court and say, my proper name is John Henry. And I say, no, you're John Doe. No, no, my proper name's John Henry. But aren't you John Doe? Yes, you're John Doe. No, you are John Doe. Well, then you say, well, I can be for a fee, which is another way of saying um, I can be if it's a lawful appointment. So, um, and then you make up your fee. I mean, if you want the money and you think they're going to go for it, probably think they are, but if you want the money and you think they're going to go for it, then uh, you'd say 10 grand. If they're after you for a $50 parking fine, you can say, um, yeah, my fee to administer this estate will be um, 5 grand if you want. Um, see what happens. Uh, but then say, so, but it's, uh, it's payable in advance. So I, I, I won't step into the office till I've received the payment because I wouldn't trust them. Uh, but see, mostly you're Mr. Doe, and if you're Mr. Doe, you're unlawful. But if you refuse, that's why I always need you to say your name, because they need you to be the administrator, because they don't have jurisdiction over anyone else. Which goes back to the first, second, third estate. They created the third estate, so they have jurisdiction over the third estate. You're operating in the third estate as administrator, so you have to operate the way they tell you. Okay? And so they need you to they need you to claim to be the administrator of the third estate. Once you do, they then have authority to instruct you on how you'll operate. And if you don't operate according to the instruction, they have authority to punish you. And that's what they do. And they punish you for your own benefit. I might have overloaded this. My son's always telling me I like, go on and on and on. Um, Think about it, roll it round. And then, oh, a movie I recommend you all watch that I think is was devised and as an analogy um, for just this situation. Uh, I do intend to read the book one day. I think the author is Alexander Dumas, but I might be wrong. Uh, it might have been someone else. The movie is The Man in the Iron Mask. And when you watch it, I want you to look at the fact that uh, the man who's in the mask is in prison and the other man is the sovereign. And take note of the way the man in the iron mask, as he is being groomed to 
replace the bad sovereign, they have to train him how to act as a sovereign. Because no one's going to believe he's a sovereign if he doesn't speak as a sovereign and carry himself as a sovereign. I, I, I think that he may have known what was really going on and he wrote that as an analogy. Whether that was to mock everyone or whether it was a clue, who can say? And who cares? He's, he's long gone. But I, I think there's a number of uh, tells on this in the movie world. The Matrix movie, obviously, I think, uh, has some parallels as well. Uh, I note that uh, the protagonist is in the Matrix, he's Mr. Anderson. Outside the Matrix, he's Neo. So he's Mr. In, uh, wrong or improper relation to the estate of Anderson. But he has but one Christian name or one first name outside the Matrix. That's Neo, which is his proper name. So, uh, you know, you, you know, sometimes you can read analogies in that were never intended, um, sometimes not. Is that in was that intentional? That he's Mr. Anderson when he's in the Matrix and he's Neo when he's outside it? Uh, and, when he's at, and even when he's inside the Matrix operating with power, he's Neo. What does he say at the end? My name is Neo. Something to think about. I think they drop little hints here and there. Hello, Aladdin. Your wish is my command. Uh, is it mocking? Possibly. Who cares? Um, there was another movie. I can't think what it was now. Anyway, I, I think that this is scattered around here, there and everywhere. And if you pay attention, it's all there. Like I said, the Biden administration. If you start getting the language of trusts, you'll start to see things. And certain, you'll hear words and that, would, that previously would have meant nothing to you. And so it's like, oh. And, you, and then if you do what I do, like I heard Biden administration, I'm like, hmm, yes, administration. And then I started thinking, well, yes, they're administering all the estates. So keep your ears open, learn the lingo, and you'll start to pick things up. And don't forget the pantomime. Like I said, the f pantomime from the, the, the land tax, the land rates, was they sent the, the multi-page document, extensive multi-page document that I sent in, back and said... Um, this can't be accepted as a defence. Didn't bother me because as soon as I, I didn't send it in as a defence, or it wasn't it wasn't sent in as a defence. It was sent in as an as an instruction from the sovereign power of the estate. It wasn't a defence. Uh, so I just I, we did not no offence defence was offered, and I can tell you, people who don't understand will say that's not a win. That's because you don't understand what's going on. How are they going to collect those rates ever if they can't get a court to enforce it? How will they do it? It's not possible. They're done. That's it. End of story. Finito. That's a win. That's a big win. That's a huge win. All right? If they can't... How are they going to collect it? You tell me. The final way of collecting a debt is to go to court... And if the people still won't pay after you get a default judgment, or, or a judgment, any judgment, um, this one should have been a default judgment. So if the sheriff can't collect, then the sheriff can't collect. Well, there's, no, there's been no judgment. The court won't issue a judgment. So they've got no way to collect. Um, the other one, how can I be yelling at this guy? And not, you know, people would think, oh, that didn't work out too well. That guy, you know, oh, I was, it was, I was speaking very forcefully, at the to, uh, close to the top of my voice, with a great deal of force. Um, and uh, you know, uh, for quite some time, uh, people next door would have heard me. People in other courts would have heard me. 
no, no question. And they're big, thick walls there for that very reason. My voice was booming. And uh, no contempt of court. Why? We're not even a threat of contempt of court. Why is that? Lack of jurisdiction? Or fear of the consequences? Because I, I wouldn't I, I went in. Um, I, was, I was content to receive a contempt of court charge. It, I probably would have got further if that had come. So people would say, oh, you were lucky that he didn't charge you with contempt of court. There's no such thing as luck. I don't believe in luck. Uh, he was lucky he was smart enough not to, not to mention it. That's what, that's what, where it is. But if you're not, if you can't read things, you're going to think, oh, that good dude was lucky he didn't get down for contempt of court. And you're going to think, I had an epic fail and just a little bit of luck that the magistrate was such a nice guy. Not the case at all, but you, you, you can't help people who can't see what's really going on. Okay? So, um, I'll leave it there, folks. Bye.